um, child sensitive budget <clears throat> uh, what what do we have in store uh, for the current budget um, there are predictions that 9 million more children would be born uh, you know in the in the duration of the uh, or or post covid as a result of covid and also um, because of the covid 19 lockdown uh, there are crippled livelihoods which will be impacting uh, children and uh, in terms of uh, child labor. Uh, the, there is a recent World Bank report that uh, says that. So even if we do uh, previous analyses of the budget, uh, budgetary allocations, that the total allocation for children specific program has remained around 0.74% of the total public expenditure of the federal governments. Uh, and less than 1.8% of the GDP during the last four years. So um, I will not go into the details of, because that is what, where I'm looking forward to Dr. Kessel Bengali given, giving us an overview. Uh, but uh, being a parliamentarian, sitting in the parliament, looking uh, towards uh, protecting children's rights, uh, the voiceless constituency, which I say, uh, who are uh, heard, not heard, but children, let me define, is 0 to 18. So it's not just very small children. So um, what do we do? Now the budget has been announced and how do we, uh, uh, you know, uh, factor in children and how do we uh, make cognizance of what is absent from the budget and what are the solutions? What, what are the recommendations? That is what we will be uh, looking towards because we would have at least two weeks of deliberations before the budget is passed and this this deliberation would uh, inform any kind of conversation going on or the speeches going on in the in the parliament. Uh, over to you, Doctor Doctor Kesar Bengali. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Manaz. If we can have a round of introductions, I do know somebody. I know Haris. Hi, Haris and Kesar Bari, and but I'm not. Uh, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting. Other people here, Ali Imran also, I think I've met. Uh, we have met, yes. Uh, Hassan? Ji, um, good afternoon. I'm Hassan. I am the national coordinator for the parliamentary SDG secretariat. And uh, we, are, we are hosting this conversation today. Uh, Dr. Sab, let me just uh, 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 share who all are joining in today. Uh, we will have MNA Zain Qureshi, who is the Parliamentary Secretary of uh, Finance, Minister of Finance. And we will have Shandana Gulzar Khan, MNA Chairperson of uh, uh, Women's Committee. Uh, 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 and uh, we will have Ms. Annabelle Jekyll, who is the country head of uh, DFID, uh, Nafisa Shah, uh, former chairperson of National Commission for Human Development. We will have Dr. Abdul Ali, regional advisor for Social Policy UNICEF, and uh, MNA Ms. Andalip Abbas, Parliamentary Secretary, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and she's very keen on. Uh, uh, yeah, with these um, the ch child protection issues. Uh, we do have Dr. Mariam Chuktai. Uh, she was, um, uh, you know, uh, she had joined and she's the Associate Dean and Assistant Professor of Lum Schools of Education. And we have, uh, we will be having Dr. Uh, Mohsin Ranja, who is a lawyer and MA uh, and a, a very vocal legislator um, and advocate. Uh, Dr. Faisal Bari, who is the Director of Academic Programs uh, at LUM School of Education. So these are uh, some of the people and we might have uh, uh, Mr. Hamad Azhar, who is the Federal Minister of Ind Industries and Production, but he presented the budget. So I've just told him, I've requested him to join in even if for five minutes to give us his comment. And we also have Ms. Anabel Sherry and Bila Feroz and Sima Zia. Uh, so, okay, uh, Manaz, as I told you when you we spoke earlier, uh, this is not a subject on which I have uh, much expertise in the, in the budgetary context that we are talking about. Uh, I am uh, a bit surprised that child-centered allocations are 0.7%. Is that what you said? 
0.74% of the total public expenditure. Uh, that uh, I would have expected it much less, but it's so the issue is how are we defining child centered uh, projects? Uh, but uh, assuming that this is the correct figure and this is the amount that is spent. I think one has to, when we are looking at all allocations for children, uh, we will also have to bring in the provincial budgets. Because after the 18th amendment, these subjects are essentially provincial subjects. And uh, at the federal level, one can expect uh, policies and policy guidelines to be set up. But that does not exclude federal government from having any direct projects uh, anywhere in the country. Uh, I also am a bit uh, confused as to how can we separate children from the families. Uh, where we have uh, a family which is facing stark poverty, uh, what kind of uh, nutrition or clothing or education uh, can be uh, can the child have? Uh, the cases that uh, I have come across in my surveys, the poor especially, uh, a typical case is both parents are working, children are left to at home uh, with the eldest uh, daughter who is herself a pre-teenager and uh, they run around the streets. Uh, sometimes they are uh, subject to dog bites. So the picture that I see of children uh, is not very happy. Uh, if we are including, I don't know what is included in the child-centered program that is 0.7%, but I, with my ex little bit of experience in the federal government, in Sin government, and in Balochistan government, I've ever, never ever come across any discussion that uh, centers on children's welfare. Uh, child labor does come up, but it uh, comes up in a very different context. It's just, uh, it, it just says that, you know, children below a certain age should not be in the labor force, and what are the laws? that are uh, about it. And there is a school of thought which wants it totally banned, another school of thought that wants it regulated. There are uh, pre-school, uh, pre-kindergarten school sections in several schools. But uh, for the vast majority of the children, this is a luxury. So I, I would actually, uh, rather than uh, give any opinions, I have all these questions in my mind. And I think if uh, we can, I, I would actually like to learn something. Uh, because I, I, and when you see children on the streets begging, I've always wondered what future does this child have? He'll probably grow up on the streets. And I, I, I was working in somewhere in Karachi and over a period of 15 years, I did see one child grow up into an adult and he was still on the street begging. So what, what future are we uh, creating for children? Uh, malnutrition, poverty, no shoes, uh, no education. So I don't know what this 0.7% is spent on. If I think if someone from the government comes and tells us what is it it's spent on, I would like to hear that. Manas? Gee, um, absolutely, Dr. Kessel. Um, uh, it, it's very difficult to um, separate the layers. You know, that is the confusion as legislation, uh, legislators also. But we are looking at, uh, you know, the larger scheme of things like education, health, social protection, 
um and um, you know uh, physical uh, like uh, child sexual abuse uh, child com uh, children's commissions you know special uh, bodies that are made but uh, we don't see um a consistent um, uh, kind of uh, uh, you know the um, consistent uh, commitment uh, in terms of uh, budgeting what we see is uh, that uh, donors uh, we have financial donors who come in and have parallel programs which are uh, the need of the hour on education and health polio others but they are not mainstream mainstreamed and pol policy comes through uh, the policy document and mainstreaming comes through the the budgeting environment and we are not seeing that and this year the budget is very uh, you know it's it's very challenging times because of covid 19 and uh, also the shrinking fiscal space so so you know it it was imperative for us to uh, start this debate on children i would like now to move to haris uh, who is uh, the special advisor to the uh, chief minister of sin and has worked is working a lot on agriculture and uh, is uh, globally uh, recognized for his work um, and of course agriculture like you said you know poverty affects children you know households you can't differentiate children from households and uh, you know agriculture also impacts children uh, and uh, Harris also works a lot on social protection how, Harris how would you like to advise us in this environment what are the questions what are the legislators what uh, legislations what what do we need to um, make sure how to protect children in this bu budgetary environment and in this budget uh, firstly I think it's a very important initiative I agree with Kaiser that there are lots of difficulties in measuring but I think that the attempt to focus minds on how much of our fiscal outlay is spent on children is very very important I presume that much of the 0.7 percent is probably accounted for by education spending, which happens in the provinces. There would be some health programs which are specific to children, and there will be a few others. But I think that this exercise, it's very important to initiate it. It's very, very important to refine, keep refining it. And there are, there are two significant reasons for that. One is that the way that government functions, and I'm a newcomer to government, so I've learned, it's a very steep learning curve. And one of the things, that is that strikes you immediately is that government is for everything and for very very few things so the government functions because it is siloed the whole functioning of government is siloed it's departmental and as soon as you legislate and you start creating a department and a silo and a ministry its own budgetary head you basically protect that interest you create a huge political economy of interest around that and so that sustains interest, that sustains resource flow into that area. There is no such possibility. There is no possibility of doing such a thing for children no. or for the elderly. I mean, we have an attempt now in Sindh for doing, doing that for people with uh, of special ability. So there is a ministry that is dealing with people. But you know, as Kaiser said correctly, that even those people would be in every other sector as well. So some of them would be in industry, some of them would be in agriculture, some of them would be affected by educational policies. But nevertheless, we do have a ministry that looks after the interests of a particular group. But for children, for women, for the elderly, you know, you can't, you don't have a center of attention within government. And you can't, right? So it's just not practical and we don't really want it like that because government functions have to be specialized along professions and along delivery. So I think this initiative is very important and it's very important to continue reminding ourselves through these exercises on an ongoing basis that there is there are implications of the budgetary process and budgetary outcomes for different segments of the population. Now, the second really important thing is that most of the people in this room, most of the people in parliament, um, regardless of our differences with, with respect to region and other differences, even political affiliations, we are very similar people. You know, we are people of a particular socioeconomic class. We are all adults. Most of us are actually older adults, but we are not the elderly. 
we are not the infirm, we are not children, we are not adolescents. So there are huge chunks of the population that we are not. We are not in this room and people in parliament are not. In, not right? So the interests of particular segments of the population by default rest with other people. So we assume that families look after children. We assume that families look after the elderly. We also have a very, very patriarchal assumption that men look after women, right? A criminal assumption, a criminal assumption. So if we, if we are truly democratic and if we actually do believe in individual rights, then that framework has to be constantly challenged and these exercises will help us challenge them. You've mentioned the COVID situation and also my work on agriculture. My work on agriculture is, it tries to straddle these things by, by paying attention to the relationship between women agricultural workers, labor, and the impact of that labor on their own health and the health of their young children. Right? So this connection between women and children, between families and children, it's very strong, but does require specific attention. The COVID situation actually helps me um, to actually bring my, uh, my, articulate my view in a very contemporary context, in a very urgent contemporary context. When this crisis started breaking, my view has always been, and the view of a lot of people has been that when you're faced with a great deal of uncertainty, how you will respond in the face of uncertainty depends on values, right? Because we don't really know what, where the global economy will be. We don't even know where the epic curve is, right? So there are lots of different models. We don't know the total number of infections we will face. We don't know the total number of fatalities we will face. So we don't know our fiscal position. So there are lots of uncertainties. When you're faced with huge amounts of uncertainty in any situation, what becomes, I mean, what guides your action at that point are values. And I fear that in public discourse in Pakistan, the values that we have espoused, the values that very powerful interests have espoused are, I think, very difficult values to reconcile with a humane society. You know, we have had discussions where We've dismissed the impact of this disease by saying that it is something that will affect the elderly and those who are anyway ill, right? So, so that might be a huge, significant proportion of the population, but forget the numbers. The issue is that those people are citizens, they have rights, they are human beings, they have rights. So this idea that people who are somehow not useful for the economy, we can dismiss them and we don't have to worry about them when we are formulating a value-based policy response applies very, very starkly to children. Right? So children, and we, you know, I think that we are very guilty as economists of actually trying to, to bridge that by making reference to things like human capital. So we appeal to the policy makers' good sense by saying that these children are the future of the economy. That's not the point. The point is that children are innocent, right? So the word in many languages, innocent, but the word for the child. So the child is innocent. The child is in, in this world. They didn't want to be here. They didn't, they didn't say they wanted to be here. They're here now. Now it is our responsibility and it's responsibility of society and the responsibility of government. So we definitely need these very special efforts that will constantly bring back attention to the importance of allocating resources and effective resources to segments of the population who are not represented. And I think that we constantly need to refine these exercises and we have to keep reminding ourselves about the values that we want to espouse as a collectivity. Uh, I'll stop here now, thanks. Thank you, Aris, uh, and especially on your uh... Um, you know, insistence on values, which is, uh, you know, in this pandemic, um, the, the inhumanity uh, has really come out, you know, people selling plasma, etc. Et but since we are talking about children, um, you know, on Twitter, individually, I've seen that uh, children are affected. Uh, but otherwise, if you look at the numbers, you know, you won't find women and you won't find children who are mentioned in the numbers. It's, it's just a number. 
So, and most men, and it may just be that most men have access to testing. That's why uh, they know uh, whether they are positive or negative. So this, this has really brought out and, and we really need to think about it. It's connected to everything we have, but, but you know, I, I think that uh, you're absolutely right that we need to have this ongoing discussion because in the last, since the last budget to this budget, you know, I've not been able to unpack uh, the focus and and as you said rightly that uh, you know creating the silos of a department you know recently the federal government has created uh, the child children's commission child rights commission and again it's very you know very much in the corner we really don't know what it's doing so and 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 uh, um, and, and the social protection departments within the provinces etc so but but we, we really do need to continue with this and here i would like to point out since you mentioned that you know uh, it, it was said and by the government that uh, you know only the elderly would be affected uh, we have a very brave coordinator Har um, hassan hakim uh, who tested positive a couple of days ago and he is uh, my right hand you know he has facilitated me to do this under tremendous stress and all of that and uh, just um, always um, uh, assuring that he's fine Hassan a big thank you to you Maybe. thank you uh, and um, so we we had uh, you know Mariam Chuktai had joined in earlier on is Mariam Chuktai still there yeah I am Acha, Maria, um, you have done a lot of work. I've been following your work on education and uh, policy implementation, and now you're at LUMS. Um, and and uh, so, what are your thoughts on uh, you know not just education but the well-being of children, um, uh, and and uh, where is it going? And especially with the pandemic, you know, with 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 the education. Uh, this the big question is education and we uh, the government the parliamentarians and others have not been able uh, to uh, wrap their heads around it that how do we figure this one out it's just the private sector that are taking the lead in terms of their interest bearing uh, initiatives and all of that so what are your thoughts in any thoughts you know you could talk about health and others but i know you are um, and mariam you know i've, I've always uh, held her um, very high uh, um, uh, in, in terms of she, she's uh, a doctorate from uh, Harvard and has been an activist, advocate and an implementer for years and years now. So Mariam, what are your comments? Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I don't think it's that deserved. I want to talk about uh, what's uh, the Committee on the Rights of the Child speaks to four issues which are all very relevant to Pakistan but you don't hear enough discourse about them. Um, I think it's a very important that we have to look at um, these four elements of uh, protecting children in Pakistan. These include involvement of children in armed conflict, um, the sale of children, uh, child prostitution and child pornography. Uh, the sale of children and child, uh, um, you know, uh, child labor is very much prevalent in our own households as well. So I think that uh, these four areas deserve a lot of attention in Pakistan's context. And um, I have rarely seen a policymaker come out and speak to these uh, aspects, specifically in the wake of the pandemic where we are going to see significant learning losses for those children who are already in school. We're not even talking about those children who were never in school and they are now becoming teenagers and they do not have access to quality content uh, for learning. Uh, these are exactly those circumstances of deprivation, of abuse that lead children who are victims of child abuse to become adults who are child abusers. Uh, who are consumers of child pornography. We do not have mental health progr programs for uh, rehabilitating pedophiles. Uh, pedophilia is a big problem in our, in our communities. So I think it's important to talk about budget reallocation, but this is not a problem on which you can just throw money and it'll go away. This is a problem on which some serious policy dialogue is needed 
some research-backed uh, interventions are, uh, are important to be brought into context. And uh, then those need to be scaled up in practice. So I think that this roundtable is a very good uh, step in that direction. Uh, but I would hope that uh, this roundtable would, would champion some of these four causes, particularly in the wake of the pandemic for Pakistan. Thank you. Very, very crisp, very focused. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, you're right. Now and again, we do mention in the parliament, but we do not follow up. You know, media is our big ally in this. Media also helps us out. But our problem is that we don't follow it up. And uh, we, we will continue talking and, and finding solutions on, on it. Annabelle, I see you. Uh, uh, hello and welcome. Um, so, um, Mohsin Ranja has joined. Uh, Mohsin, are you there? Uh, Mohsin had to leave uh, for a quick uh, meeting. So he's going to join us again. Okay, I wanted to get his... Are, are we getting any other parliamentarians? Uh, Sandana and Mohsin, they're going to join us soon. Uh, please ask Mohsin to just give us five minutes okay. because we do need a parliamentarian response to it as well. And what about Andleep? Uh, and the lib is on her way. Uh, th th there's been a meeting at the PM office, so they're stuck yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, I know about that meeting. So um, uh, I think uh, we can take uh, Annabelle, uh, who has just joined. Uh, Annabelle Diffid has been a champion of uh, financing uh, education in Pakistan and health and others. And now you're, uh, I think, financing the uh, very big um, labor, uh, child labor exercise as well, uh, research and exercise as well. Uh, so, uh, how how would you like to see all this work integrated into the mainstream? What do you think are the challenges, and uh, how can we um, and and especially the, on need based? What what is required by Pakistan? What are your thoughts? And if there is anything else that you find important and you would like to mention, please feel free to. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm aware that there's a lot of knowledge in this virtual room. So thank you so much for giving me space. I'm going to try and follow Mariam's example and be quite brief. Um, so I wanted to kind of make four points moving backwards, uh, D, C, B, A rather than A, B, C, D. I'm left-handed, so you can blame it on that for going backwards through the alphabet. So the first thing which I'd like to th say that we need to think about is to demand data. That's my D. I think data is really powerful. We've already started to talk about the absolute numbers. What does it mean? And I think there's more that we could do. And I think um, you as the SDG unit, the parliamentarians demanding more disaggregated data, not just in the traditional areas of health, education, gender-based violence, but I think, you know, really pushing food insecurity. What do we know about children? Economic exploitation. What do we know about children? You've mentioned the slave uh, labor, uh, uh, child labor study. So I think this is, this is really powerful data, you know, be very demanding and, you know, that will get you to able to answer the question really clearly what's in the best interests of children when it comes to budgets. So that's the first. Secondly, and Harris has referred to this, it's choose children. That's my C. I think there's a, there's a phrase you probably all heard, nothing about us without us. I think this is particularly so with children. A young person's voice can be far, far more influential um when meeting policymakers influences than as you said yourself some of us who are not so young anymore um we don't have that credibility i have three teenagers in the house they see the world differently and you all know this so i think any opportunities that you can find to actually get a children's voice and maybe can we be creative at the moment while we're still on zoom it's actually easier to do it in a safeguarding friendly way for a child to really express his or her opinion on what matters in the budget. So if you could do some of that during the budget deliberations, I think that would be brilliant and very, very powerful um, for people to hear. Third point is to be bold. I think you are quite bold, but really, you know, put this in. This is not just about getting through COVID. This is about securing the future and making the points that have already come up in this conversation. Just a few months lost for education of a child is a lifetime's impact. They miss their vaccinations, a lifetime's impact. So be very bold in the advocacy. And I think you can't overdo it um, with children. Um, and 
although we're in a sort of emergency stage now, making the point as, as a community who cares about children, about the need to think about choices now and how those will impact their life chances in the longer term, I think it's powerful. Um, and um, as you said, education continues to be a real concern for us. We're very, very worried indeed about delayed opening to schools. What investment is going into schools, helping them open up? What are we going to do about those kids who perhaps weren't in there before and certainly won't get back now? The kids who were in but will be at risk of not going back now because of hardship in the family and having lost out. So a real strong focus on those things and on sort of routine um, vaccinations, routine care for children, that if this is not invested in now if it's not really pushed now those children's life chances will be changed so that's about being bold on behalf of children and the last one links to that is my a advocate action you're all effective advocates and um if you can bring in their their voices to this debate great but also i think there's a lot of power um as well in the forum that the children cannot be in in parliament so that's all i wanted to say thank you hope some of that's helpful Thank you so much, Annabelle. Yes, that's uh, indeed very helpful. And uh, yes, we always uh, talk about this in the parliament, uh, and especially since the last one year of the missing voices of children. Um, as we are waiting for other parliamentarians to join, today is the first day that the debate starts in uh, the parliament uh, after the budget. So they're all, uh, you know, either there's a meeting going on at the prime minister's office. Ahmad uh, Azhar was supposed to join us and he promised five minutes. Let's see if he joins or not. Um, I see Aleem Saab, who's the regional um, advisor uh, to, to uh, UNICEF. Um, what, what are, uh, what, what's happening in the region and how can we be informed from the region uh, as to, um, uh, you know, the budgets and children or just simply bringing in uh, children to the thinking process and that we take uh, cognizant of children? Okay, so I think the second thing I want to say was that um, we uh, have a real serious issue in South Asia in the sense of a weakness of social contract. And uh, that has to do with the fact that, and that reflects in the fact that we have very low tax to GDP ratios. We have very high levels of informal economy. You know, 75% of our employment is in actually informal jobs, which means that people don't want to be really in touch with the government. So I think that that's a real issue with uh, budgetary constraints. Although when we talk about fiscal space, it seems that every time there is a talk about investing in children, or uh, the, uh, the younger population, we start talking about fiscal space. The discussion of fiscal space doesn't happen when we are talking about other allocations, building a road or making other allocations that are sometimes untouchable. So I think that uh, subjecting uh, children and the discussion on children to availability of fiscal space is a very unjust, uh, unfair argument to start with. Um, we, have, we have now studies in South Asia that are available which shows that a full inclusive uh, social protection, universal social protection for children, let's say a universal child benefit, in many countries in South Asia can be done with just 2% of GDP. And I think that's one of the ways to actually break the vicious cycle of low investment, low tax to GDP ratios and low human capital in South Asia, where you need to start building trust between citizens and the state by actually starting social protection, inclusive social protection mechanisms which allow citizens to start trusting the state, thereby affecting not only the economy, but also perhaps even adjusting or uh, rising the tax to GDP ratios. Um, the, the last thing I want to say is that um, we have now understanding from uh, an, a new survey that has come out in Pakistan, where two, two interesting things have emerged. One is uh, the answer to, uh, uh, to Kaiser Bengali's first point was that how are children really affected is that despite um, uh, that, that, you know, in Punjab, for instance, we have found out that in households, when you disaggregate the effects of poverty in a household, children are disproportionately affected living in a poor household because usually households com compare uh, are comprised many of many children. And we looked at the disaggregation of age groups and the age groups of zero to four and five to nine are the most affected in the sense that even if the overall poverty is around 30, 31%, the age group of zero to four and five to nine is affected almost 40 to 45% more. So we know that there is a, 
a, a differential impact of uh, household poverty on children. And that really makes a strong case for making sure that we make a special case in the budgets for children. Last thing I want to say is that if you look at analysis of budget in many countries in South Asia, there is a mismatch between life cycle investments, which are important in terms of brain growth and the budgetary investment in that age group. So we know that early childhood, the first 300 days and the adolescent age group where you have the highest brain growth period, uh, we have the lowest amount of investment in those periods with the budget uh, uh, for, for, uh, for many countries in South Asia. So the, the disparity between actually where the budget is needed, where the money is needed and when the brain edge is actually growing is really stark. Uh, and Maraz, when you mentioned the amount of GDP that is being invested in, in children in, in the budgets in Pakistan, I, I must say that that's really shocking to me because our analysis in Bangladesh shows that 2.5% of GDP really goes to children related budgets, uh, children related allocations in Bangladesh. And that may be the differential between us and Bangladesh, who is be doing better in one sense as compared to Pakistan. So I would really, uh, I would say that the last thing I want to say on COVID is the fact that there is, of course, now information uh, in Pakistan through surveys that is available where you can look at specific vulnerability factors that are going to multiply the effects of COVID. So, for instance, there are surveys that are available in, uh, in Pakistan, uh, a survey in Punjab, for instance, which says that you could actually look at overcrowding, uh, hand washing practices, household sizes, and can look at multiple, multiple variables which can tell you which households are at higher risk of uh, facing uh, COVID uh, issues. I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, I've run out of one meeting and I'm on my way to the assembly. Uh, so Louise, uh, my sincerest apologies. I will only take two minutes of your time. Uh, Manas, thank you for having me. Uh, so uh, I'm here. I just want to give you a very brief synopsis, if I can, uh, of the government's um, uh, intent uh, uh, through the budget, the budget that we have just presented. Um, and that will give you an idea of how serious we are when it comes to healthcare in general and health uh, and specifically of mother and children. Um, so the one thing uh, which uh, you should consider as a highlight is the fact that the healthcare spending for this budget has been increased by 130%. So previously, if we were spending 11 billion rupees on healthcare, that has been increased to 25 and a half billion rupees. That's 130% increase uh, off the bat. Um, uh, there's a lot of information here, but I'm going to try and give you very specifics. Um, we have uh, increased budget allocation in healthcare sector, uh, and this should obviously help us with SDG3, which is why we're, I think, here right now, um, which is uh, good health and well-being. Um, in specific to uh, mother and child care, I think a very important decision has been taken, uh, which is that uh, special food supplements for children with genetic birth problems and uh, basically nursing mothers. Uh, we are manufacturing a lot of the products in Pakistan. So um, supplementary foods for children and exempted mothers are now being manufactured in Pakistan under the World Food Programme. And the government has proposed exemptions of all custom duties uh, on raw materials for that, which should essentially bring down the cost of production for these items, uh, which obviously uh, is, a, is a relief in itself. Uh, there's a 32 billion rupee uh, project called the Punjab Human Capital Investment Project, uh, which is essentially there to strengthen primary healthcare facilities and to provide a cash transfer uh, to the poor people, people who can't actually afford good healthcare. So to give them access to healthcare and nutrition, uh, uh, there's a 32 billion rupee project. Uh, this is essentially, it's a Punjab based project. So it's essentially for the 11 districts. Uh, of Punjab, which are underdeveloped, which are mostly in the south. So districts like Bahawal Nagar, Bahawalpur, Bakhar, Dera Ghazi Khan, Khushab, Naya, Nodhra Miya, Wali, Muzaffar Gar, Rehmer Khan, uh, all covered in this district. Um, there are other things that we have done in the education sector and other sectors which do have a spin-off effect on healthcare, but I'm going to uh, stick to healthcare right now. Then um, another major thing that has been done in this budget is uh, they an allocation of 24 billion rupees for SDGs, basically, and to achieve our SDG goals. 
so um, uh, hopefully that money will go towards uh, better utilization uh, or, or better achievement of our SDG goals and that in turn uh, will, uh, will reflect in better quality education and better health care for mother and children. So these are just some of the things uh, that we have uh, in this budget tried to do to further uh, the cause of this committee uh, and help with uh, you know, health care in general and mother and child uh, health. So I just thought I'd give you a little synopsis of that. Thank you, Zain. Thank you so much. This is helpful. And we'll keep you updated with all the conversations uh, that are going on uh, so that the budgetary um, uh, debates are uh, like more informed. I am always available to you and whatever information you need, I will pass on to you. Unfortunately, I will have to beg your leave because I have to be in the parliament at 4 p.m. So thank you for having me once again, but I'm always here to help. Thank you. Thank you, Zain. Most appreciated. Luis, thank you so much for your patience. No, no, Magnus, thank you very much. And uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Salam alaikum. Um, so first of all, to congratulate you, uh, Magnus, and the SDG, uh, the SDGs uh, group in the parliament for this uh, effort. It is very significant. And uh, Magnus, you in particular have become uh, one of uh, the most prestigious children advocate, advocate in, in the country. So we always recognize the great partnership with you and UNICEF recognizes your work and the work of the uh, special committee that you are chairing. Uh, you asked about opportunities and challenges. Well, of course, there are uh, hundreds of opportunities. If we look at the CEDAW, for instance, and all of the commitments that the country has signed, that Pakistan, the government of Pakistan has signed, can be an opportunity for us to uh, reflect around financial allocations. In the first place, the CEDAW, for instance, the Convention of the Right of the, Ch of the Child, for instance, the CRC, and obviously the SDGs, the three um, commitments provide a, a framework with a wealth of opportunities to direct our energies or the government's energies around uh, uh, efficient allocation of financial resources. Um, so uh, from UNICEF perspective, uh, uh, we celebrate uh, some of the increases in the, in the budget around health and education, uh, although we believe that more can be done around it. Um, uh, perhaps a little bit of concern around the exact numbers um, around uh, COVID-19 specific budgets. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, the United Nations country team uh, supported the uh, development of a rapid assessment with the Ministry planning development and reform, and then uh, it was adopted by the government as, uh, as the immediate response. And um, it will be, it, there is an opportunity out there to actually try and analyze how much of the budget was actually allocated to this rapid assessment developed, uh, led by the, resident, the UN Resident Coordinator, uh, Coordinator's Office and um, enriched with the comments and inputs from all of the agencies. So there is a huge opportunity there because uh, there is a lot of expertise and a lot of time invested and resources invested in trying to develop a very comprehensive uh, framework uh, for a rapid response to the COVID-19 situation uh, with very clear lines around uh, the allocation of the budget so I think this is the, the most important uh, um, opportunity and uh, there is uh, an invitation to work with UNICEF on these lines. We are working on, on, on three or four specific strategic lines around the budget allocation in Pakistan. And one of them is precisely this one, the, the relationship and the alignment between the money that was allocated in the budget to specific actions in the rapid assessment uh, produced or developed by the UNCT. 
Another area of opportunity, another, another line of work that UNICEF has been engaging with is in partnership with the European Union, uh, with the support uh, from uh, Abdul Alim and uh, our regional office. We have engaged in provincial analysis around uh, efficiency of allocation uh, uh, for the budget. Uh, the first analysis will be produced uh, for SIN, for the SIN province. And uh, it will be a comprehensive analysis around uh, allocations, gender sensitive allocations uh, for in the province uh, for children and for specific sectors, uh, nutrition, uh, child protection, uh, education and health and WASH also. And we will roll out this work to the rest of the provinces as soon as we finish and in one of the provinces and then integrate the lessons learned for us to present a national report on how much are we actually allocating for children in Pakistan. So um, the work is an, is an ongoing exercise, but we'll invite uh, all participants to this meeting to, to actually integrate efforts and we will be happy to, to share uh, what, what is it that we're doing in that respect. The other line of work is uh, around uh, a post-budget analysis uh, that is being led by my colleague uh, um, Sada Sufika uh, uh, and that implies uh, also an analysis of the actual budget and uh, how is this allocated and how is this going to affect uh, children. And we will be very happy to share the results of that analysis with yourselves and to avoid uh, why the uh, audience as well. So these are the opportunities that we foresee. Uh, in terms of the challenges, I think we will all share the, the idea around uh, technical support. I think in previous conversations we have talked about trying to uh, combine efforts and skills, UNICEF and the Parliament, around uh, um, budget analysis and advocacy messages around uh, the budget allocation. So that's a challenge, but also an opportunity that we, we, we would like to bring again on, on the table and then to discuss for us to find a way to um, contribute to uh, the strengthening of the parliamentarian skills around uh, budget allocation. I think this is it. Uh, I'm open to questions as well, although I have to go to another meeting, but I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Magnus, and congratulations again. We, we can't hear you, Magnus, you are muted. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and um, this is one of the many meetings that we will be holding uh, towards solutions. Uh, and uh, as, as, uh, as indicated by um, uh, Dr. Kaiser Bengali, as indicated by Haris Kasdar, uh, you know, it's it's the lens and the values that we hold and uh, that needs to change. It can't be just numbers and uh, just uh, cognizance of, um, uh, you know, expenditures, etc. But the well-being of children as well. So we will have to look at it from that lens. This is what I've learned from it. It's, it's a very, very important um, element and data, of course. Annabelle, um, data is missing. Uh, you know, in the last few years, we have just uh, let go of, um, you know, data, data gathering and uh, informing ourselves uh, with data. And we look forward to working with DFID on that uh, important uh, element. Uh, so um, I'd go back to uh, Kessler's and also one point uh, um, I wanted to make with uh, Luis. Luis, uh, in your post, uh, you, you know, in your... Uh, uh, budgetary analysis, I think uh, you can uh, involve some of the uh, people who are uh, in this group today. Uh, they, they are uh, academics, very highly informed people. And I think that it would make your exercise uh, even more worthwhile if you were to do that so that it's, uh, uh, it's helpful for the policymakers and the parliamentarians as well. So, um, because uh, it's been an hour and uh, the parliamentary session has also started and all of you have given us a lot of time. And uh, is there any comment that you would like to make, Annabel? Is there any comment that you would like to make? Uh, 
the point for addressing children's needs. Over to you, Maharaj. Thank you so much, uh, Kesar Saab, and uh, very important points that you have made, and especially on uh, you know the provision of uh, quality education and uh, value systems. Thank you so much, and uh, I would like to round up the session now. But uh, it seems that uh, we will be um, bothering you again, all of you, uh, because uh, how to move forward? It's it's not easy. If you want to um, give value to children women and poor it's not easy and we will have to and we, we all have worked uh, a lot in these areas and we will have to do things differently thank you so much thank you